Welcome to Monday Night Live, the YouTube show all about Notre Dame football from the staff at Inside ND Sports and the Rivals Network that will rock your world or at least snow on it. I'm Eric Hansen. He's Tyler James. Our recruiting writer, Kyle Kelly, is making snow angels and getting ahead of the curve on the latest recruiting developments. Meanwhile, Tyler and I tonight will break down Notre Dame's 44-0, punking of Boston College and all the cultural appropriations that came with it. We'll also spin it forward <laughs> into what it means into the big picture of the postseason and beyond, and we'll take your questions. That segment is coming up, so start filling up the question portal. Man, you had so many punchlines in there. I don't even know which one to start with, but I, I <laughs> wanted to start with Kyle Kelly doing uh, Snow Angels. He he deserves to do some Snow Angels after all the t hard work he's been doing the last couple of days, and uh, if you are an Inside ND Sports subscriber, he has an update about Kenny Minchie and t t actually spoke to Kenny Minchie, the three-star quarterback who visited Notre Dame this past weekend. And I think uh, Notre Dame fans will be uh, pleased to sort of see what Kenny Minchie had to say about his visit. So if you are looking for some recruiting updates, uh, head to InsideNDSports.com and Kyle Kelly has you covered. And uh, as as Eric said, you can send in your questions. A uh, special shout out to Mike DeVoy who submit, submitted questions ahead of time, which you are allowed to do. We post uh, the link to the uh, the live show usually about 24 hours in advance so you can get in there and um, submit a comment ahead of time and for those who don't know how to do that if you're tuning in um, and don't know how you can either do that on a desktop um, there should be a chat box to the right of the uh, of the YouTube video screen uh, or um, if you're on a mobile device this comment section should be below so you can just submit questions there either during the live show or beforehand, and we will get to as many of them as we can during the show. Um, also make sure you hit the thumbs up to the, like this video and subscribe to us. That helps us get in front of more viewers. But after that long preamble, uh, <laughs> we are going to uh, get to Eric's five headlines from Marcus Freeman's press conference earlier Monday. Eric, what was your first uh, headline? Well, what I also led my notebook today and, and I thought the, most interesting thing to me was the evolution of the Notre Dame defense. You know, a lot of times people had asked us during the year why the linebackers in particular were struggling, but why the defense would give up these big chunk plays. Suddenly they're going up against the top 10 defense in the regular season finale. It'll be the third time they faced one this year. And the other two are North Carolina and Ohio State, and they are still top 10 defenses. But this time they do so with the number 17 total defense in the country. And, and it's been kind of a slow, quiet climb to that point. And, and how significant number 17 is. If Notre Dame was able to, and this is going to be difficult against USC and a bowl opponent, but if they're able to hold or climb, it would be the highest that they finished in total defense since the 2012 team finished seventh. So even if they drop a little bit, that's quite an accomplishment for a team that had a lot of holes defensively at the beginning of the year. What was interesting to me in that conversation, Tyler, was, you know, I remembered Marcus Freeman, and he brought this up today, saying, you know, when I hire a defensive coordinator, I want to keep things with as much continuity. These kids ha had to change schemes. And then he hires somebody like Al Golden, who wasn't, I mean, it wasn't like he imposed a 34 or something like that, but there was a lot of difference in philosophy in playing defense, a lot of differences in scheme, differences in terminology. And, and it really, you know, especially like the Marshall game, it really showed up in games like that because Marshall really isn't a very good offense. They are a pretty good defense, but they're not a very good offense. And it showed up in big chunk mistake plays throughout kind of the beginning and the middle of the season. And now when you've looked at this team the past few games, and again, some of these teams are offensively challenged, but they have really shut them down. You're seeing the best football we've seen from the linebackers, particularly we're seeing ascending players like Xavier Watts. Uh, it's, it's just really impressive, but boy, they have a big challenge ahead of them on Saturday. Yeah, we get we get to find out what it all means this weekend, but it certainly uh, it's it's encouraging to see the progress, and it is well earned and deserved. I, I it's it's certainly they've caught some breaks along the way. I mean, especially when you think back to the Syracuse game with Garrett Schrader being limited, 
Um, that certainly helped Notre Dame. And uh, but every team goes against that. I mean, TCU, uh, one of the top teams in the country, who's still undefeated, has, has gone against a number of backup quarterbacks this season. And uh, you don't uh, you don't complain about it. You you play who who you're asked to play against. And, and Notre Dame has has done a pretty good job as of late defensively. You can sort of see the growth there. I think the, you highlighted the linebackers, but I think and and some of the secondary players. But I think pretty much throughout the defense, I think they've been getting better. I think everywhere right. you can point to one or two or even more players who have improved at, at different position groups. And even if they haven't improved, maybe like if you're talking about Isaiah Foskey, maybe come back to form. There were parts of the season where it was like, man, what's going on with Isaiah Foskey? And then he's, he's looked pretty good um, the last several games. So um, I think it's setting up for an interesting matchup. This is certainly, I think probably the biggest challenge Notre Dame has faced defensively. I, I think, I think USC's offense is even better than, than Ohio state's offense this season. Um, I just think there's just so many different weapons. And I think that's what really challenges you. Right. Caleb Williams is more elusive as a quarterback yep. um, and he can make some mistakes too. Um, but I, I just think that the running threat that he's going to present the number of different receivers that Notre Dame will have to shut down. Notre Dame's done a pretty good job against wide receivers. Um, they faced uh, three of the top 10 receivers, 10 pass catchers in the country, according to the Blitnikoff Award, um, as the semifinalists were named this season. So they've done a decent job against those guys. I don't think any of them have caught more than five passes or more than like 65 yards against Notre Dame this season. And Jordan Addison is also a semifinalist, a USC wide receiver who actually won the award last season at Pittsburgh. So this will be the biggest test and what better place to do it that uh, in the regular season finale against your rival USC. Well, you know, when I was watching the UCLA game, which was 48-45 USC, and the um, thing that was that struck me was how many really good receivers USC has. You know, when you look at Boston College, they have Zay Flowers and right. not, not a lot else. Josh Downs is clearly the best guy North Carolina has. And, and uh, I, Ohio State had multiple receivers. The thing the USC doesn't have, they – they lost one of their running backs to injury. Um, they they're deep at that position, but they're not particularly explosive at that position. But you're right, Caleb Williams. His the way he gets out of stuff. He's like a Houdini. The times <laughs> I've seen him play, it just it is amazing. Now UCLA's defense wasn't very good. Um, USC has only faced two top sixty defenses this year. And that was Utah, which they scored 42 points against. Utah's, I believe, 25th. And Oregon State is in that same realm. And Oregon State held them to 17 points. That was a 17-14 game. The Utah game, though, was their loss. They lost 43-42. UCLA's defense was terrible. The thing that's really going to be interesting is USC's defense. Um, they're 96th in total defense. Uh, they gave up 45 points despite turning UCLA over four times. Um, so you're just, but, but Notre Dame, I don't think is built to punish you in the way UCLA punishes you and some of the other teams they face. They don't have that elite quarterback. I think that's where USC's defense is at its weakest. It's, it's curious to see how they're going to handle a really good running team. But my sense is they're going to take a lot of chances. Boston College could not incorporate some of the concepts that Navy gave Notre Dame so much trouble with, with their defense, with pressures. USC has the kind of personnel to do that. So it's going to be interesting to see how much risk they take and bringing extra pressure on Saturday night. Yeah, this uh, sort of reminds me of our press conference today with Marcus Freeman when he said, uh, I know you guys don't want to spend too much time talking about Boston College. We've already <laughs> jumped ahead to talking about USC in the first few minutes. But, uh, Eric, go ahead and give us uh, your second headline from Marcus Freeman's press conference earlier Monday. Well, the, the second headline is, where's Steve Angeli? I was <laughs> walking from my car to the stadium today, and it's not that far of a walk. And I got stopped twice on on that trip by people hey hey just just a minute just a minute can you tell me um why steve angeli didn't play in the game and the reason is what we kind of assumed that notre dame was playing the red shirt game now 
early in the year after Tyler Buckner got hurt, they, they want to play Steve Angeli as much as they could and redshirt year be damned. The, the problem or the, I guess not the problem, but the benefit of him not being able to get into many games was suddenly that redshirt year was in sight. So he's played in two games. Had he played in the Boston College game, he would have been at three, and the limit you can play is four. So that would have meant he could have only played either in the USC game or the bowl game. So Notre Dame, before the game, decided we're going to we're gonna try at all costs to redshirt him, so we're not going to plug him in at the end of this game. We're going to have him available for USC in the bowl game. So that was that was the deal there. That was the big mystery. And then the one guy asked me, well, how come Ron Paulus didn't come in? I didn't have an answer for him. Do you? <laughs> uh, I don't know that they trust Ron Paulus to, to get to come into the game. Uh, I think that's probably the only way I could put that. I mean, if they did, they'd put him in there to get Drew Pine out of there and avoid maybe Drew getting injured in some way. But um, that was the what Notre Dame opted to do in that situation. Um, that was, like you said, that was sort of my – theory um once it got late in the game and they decided not to play Steve Angeli that maybe this was what they were eyeing and and it makes sense i mean it's 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 bad that Notre Dame is in this situation where <laughs> uh it has to sort of be prepared to play Steve Angeli in the last two games um and not have to burn his redshirt i think i'd be curious to say see like, like you said they probably wouldn't have cared as much if they got him in the, some of the games earlier i don't know if that's true or not, they probably would have held him out regardless and then had to play him if they had to play him maybe. Um, so I, I just think that, and people I, I've heard from people that say, well, why does Notre Dame care if he needs a fifth year? If he's not, if he's not, if he's not the quarterback by then, uh, why, why should we care whether he has, has a, has, he keeps that year of eligibility. And I, I just think one, it's in the bench, best interest of the player. And two, who knows if you would need him? I mean, would anyone have known that Ian book was going to need his, his fifth year? Would anyone, uh, at, at Wisconsin, know that Jack Cohn was going to need his fifth year, and that both of those things benefited Notre Dame in the long run the, the previous two seasons. So um, I think that it's just it's just best. I think probably for everyone involved. I I strongly believe that Steve Angeli handing balls off in the snow was not going to put him in a better position to beat USC mm -hmm. this week if he got thrown into the game. There's just not that much that's going to carry over. Granted, I would have liked to have seen him get more reps earlier in the season, but I. I said this whether it was on our podcast or one of our Monday Night Live shows that at a certain point of the season, we, we got to the point where it was too late for it to make that big of a difference for what Steve Angeli was going to be able to do for Notre Dame or be prepared for in, in a game this season. Um, and so I think what he has done in practices and in those two game appearances that he had um, mean a lot more to what he would be able to do in against USC or in the bowl game um, than what he would have been able to do uh, against Boston College uh, in the second half of that blowout. Yeah, there's there's not probably a bowl game or or the USC game where he's going to get much snow experience. He's not <laughs> going to be able to use that. Although I will say, and and this is this bowl isn't in play anymore. The Sun Bowl in 2010, it snowed in El Paso to the point that they were the the grounds crew brought lunch tables in, turned them on their sides, and were scraping the snow off of the turf <laughs> with the lunch tables, but. That's resourceful, uh, at least. That is resourceful. <laughs> but I, you know, when we're talking San Diego, Jacksonville, and Orlando, I think it's pretty safe that it's not going <laughs> to snow in one of those places. Well, if it snows in any of those places, I'm 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 calling you immediately. <laughs> well, remember <laughs> the uh, the uh, Camping World Bowl? It got down to like 50 there. Yeah, it was pretty and cool. Mike Varell said he was coming out of a restaurant, and there was a young lady that looked at him and said if it gets any colder than this i am going to die and i think it was 58 <laughs> degrees so hopefully yeah. she survived they're not as prepared for the cold weather which uh, uh marcus freeman said today he thinks is a distinct advantage he would he would openly welcome the opportunity if in a 12 team playoff notre dame gets to host a, a team from the south or from the west um, in, in some weather like Notre Dame was able to host Boston College. Who both Boston College should be better prepared to handle that than maybe some of those other teams would, but um, it didn't seem to matter on Saturday. That'd be something. All right, Eric, what is your third headline from Marcus Freeman's press conference earlier Monday? 
My third headline is where is Tyler Buckner? And the reason I said that, you know, I asked actually asked Marcus Freeman about him on the Thursday Zoom last week. And Marcus said, yeah, he's begun practicing. You know, as far as we know, the timeline for his return is still January. He's not doing any contact work. You know, he does some drills, does some rehab stuff. And then today there was a follow-up from Sean Styers about that. And suddenly it looks like Tyler Buckner has a chance maybe to play in a bowl game. Now they wouldn't rush him um, to do that. But Marcus said, you know what, if it's the best thing for him, if he's fully healed and can protect himself, they're going to figure it out over the next two weeks, whether that's realistic. And if it is, you know, I think he would train as the backup as they go into their bowl game, but it's, it's interesting if the timeline does move up and he, he is able to play, I doubt that they would make a change there. But just him being able to practice in December would be very beneficial in terms of being ready to compete in 2023 to be the starter. Yeah, I've noticed uh, before and as we're doing our Tuesday post-practice interviews over at the Indoor Athletics Complex, I uh, – sort of keep my eye on the field to see who's leaving and who's dressed, who's not dressed. And for instance, like uh, Brandon Joseph has been in a boot the last two times we were at Tuesday practices. So I felt pretty confident that he probably wasn't going to play on Saturday. And the last couple of times I've also noticed Tyler Buckner um, in uniform. He hasn't been wearing pads, but he's been in full uniform otherwise um, with a red Jersey on like any other quarterback would be. That's not like a scout team quarterback. So he's definitely been, doing some things in practice. I don't know to what extent Marcus Freeman said today that he's doing some things. He's obviously not being hit in any way, um, but they're able to get him running around and doing some things. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure it probably helps a little bit that it's throwing shoulders and the shoulder that was injured. um, So you could probably toss the ball around a little bit. Um, So I I think some people spotted him. I didn't actually see him, but I heard that he was actually in full pads uh, during the game on Saturday. And, and I don't think that was necessarily because he was going to play. It's probably a, a warmth measure as much as anything is a lot, probably a bit warmer wearing shoulder pads than, than to not be wearing them. But um, that's, it is encouraging to hear that he is um, recovering and they're not ruling out the possibility of him being able to play in that bowl game. So if that, if it does heal, heal fine and the doctors give him the green light, um, I imagine they would find some role for him. I'm, I'm in agreement with you that they probably wouldn't make him the starter. Although, I mean, if 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 he were healthy enough early enough, there's still plenty of time to get him ready to start in that game. But I just think, as a reward for to Drew Pine for everything he's gone through and played through this season, um, to give to let him continue to start and then sort of um, augment the offense with Tyler Buckner, sort of in similar ways that we saw last season um, in Tyler Buckner helping out Jack Cohn. What will become of Mitchell Evans and Mitchell Palooza? <laughs> I still think that's in there. I, I, I don't know yeah. that they'd want Tyler Buckner doing QB sneaks uh, uh, with his shoulder either. Even if he is given the green light, there's no necess- no need for him to go in there. But, uh, Mitchell Evans is still bigger than Tyler Buckner. Yeah. And just about everybody else. <laughs> All right. A reminder, please submit your questions if you'd like to get to them or like us to answer them. We will get to them after we conclude our headlines. And I believe, Eric, we're at headline number four. Number four, injury report. And you handled this today. Uh, Jason Adam Malola, starting defensive tackle. He's back from a concussion. Brandon Joseph is, well, at least he's probable. Brandon Joseph is also probable. He uh, has missed the last two games with a high ankle sprain that he suffered during the Clemson game. Uh, in the first weekend of November. Then Mitchell Evans and Isaiah Foskey, tight end and defensive end, they never left, but they are probable after sustaining some injuries in the um, Boston College game. Mitchell Evans was an ankle injury. Not sure what Isaiah Foskey's was. Uh, Didn't keep him from getting his school record 25th sack. Questionable, and these, at least the first one's pretty huge cornerback cam hart with a shoulder seems like that shoulder he's never looked to me the guy that we saw pre-shoulder injury this year i thought he was a much more consistent better tackler better player last year and then tobias merriweather the freshman receiver he'll miss probably miss his third straight game in concussion protocol although again questionable doesn't mean he's out 
but we won't have the benefit of Thursday Zoom this week to check on those injuries. So I would not be real optimistic about him playing, which knocks Notre Dame down to five receivers, which seems like half of what USC has. Um, but Cam Hart being out with a shoulder, if that happens, we're going to see a lot more of Jaden Mickey, who's a Southern California uh, product. He played 30 snaps in the Boston College game, which is his career high. It was also the second most among the corners behind only fellow freshman uh, Benjamin Morrison. <laughs> That's the guy, Benjamin Morrison, uh, or as uh, I've I've come to call him, Benmo. Um, I know people like to call him Bmo, but Benmo, like the Venmo app, I I think is kind of good because he's been pretty money for Notre Dame this season. Um, I would be a little bit more. I think there's a, a greater chance for Tobias Merriweather to play than I think you indicated. I, I mean, we don't know, and I think that's why right. Marcus Freeman labelism is questionable. He hasn't necessarily hit that point in the co concussion protocol that that's given him the clear to get back out there. I had heard last week that he was getting better, um, so I, I would I was thinking that he might play, but if if he's not, that's certainly not something that they want to mess around with. Um, keep the guys that are dealing with concussions. Um, healthy and his his symptoms have sort of lingered so that's something that they've been keeping a close eye on so he would certainly be a, a, a welcomed addition because th th we have seen what he can do although we haven't seen a lot of it um he brings a a, a dynamic uh addition to notre dame's offense which they don't necessarily have a ton of at the wide receiver position although Deion colsey has definitely stepped up in recent weeks and been a big third down target for for drew pine um, he's not necessarily running away from guys in the ways that we think Tobias Merriweather can, um, but he's he is he is a big target. Uh, gives another guy for for Drew Pine to to look for um, when maybe when some things are falling apart, and um, gives him an easier target to throw it to as well. All right, Eric, let's hit your fifth and final headline from Marcus Freeman's press conference. It is portal poignancy, and what I mean by that is. Um, you know, there's some really good things about the portal. There's some not so good things. And Marcus Freeman was asked about it, and he kind of hit on both sides of the equation. And really, when you see this matchup on Saturday night, it is extremes with portal usage. USC, 42% of its roster has transferred either junior college, just a few, or from another four-year school, a whole bunch, including most of their star players, including Caleb Williams, who came from Oklahoma, Jordan Addison from Pitt, you can go on and on. Notre Dame has four transfers out of 85 scholarship players. Actually, three of them are scholarship players. John Sott is a walk-on transfer from Harvard, the punter. Uh, the others are Blake Groupie, Chris Smith, the defensive lineman from Harvard, and then Brandon Joseph from Northwestern. And what Marcus said, and and I think this is, I think this is a really good lesson, is that a lot of kids, because there's not that one year waiting period, and we're talking about all schools, not just Notre Dame. There's a tendency when things get difficult to say, you know what, I'm going to go to the portal instead of trying to work your way through difficult times, and then, you know, and he he feels like that's a life lesson. He does not. You know, he's he's like, you know, sometimes if you got your Notre Dame degree, you're not going to have playing time. It's not going to work out. Sometimes, you know, uh, roster turnover is, is good for a team, a certain amount of it. But but I think he's thinking more about young players that kind of give up on being able to climb that depth chart and, and get to the top of it because there's some development going on and that they just decide to go other places. So I thought it was an interesting conversation, but it's certainly working for teams. The question was asked in the context of how much is too much? Should there be limits on teams of how many guys they can bring in in a given year or on a roster total? But right now there's not limits and USC is certainly a team that took advantage of that. Uh, yeah, li limits are things that are going away from college football. So yeah. I don't know that uh, that will that will be introduced. So I imagine many coaches would like to see that because they are worried about losing so many young players from their rosters, and even the smaller schools are worried that the bigger schools will then poach them in sort of the second round of of recruiting. Um, and so it's 
I understand the concerns. Um, the sort of the concept of running away from your problems and not sticking it out isn't necessarily a new one, although it is probably happening at a higher frequency with the current um, setup. You could always transfer out and then have to sit out a year, but you were more or less punished unless you wanted to transfer to a lower division and then you could go there and then go somewhere else. And so um, there were there were loopholes that people um, would go through and, and find. And this is sort of just open it up for everyone. Hey, get a lawyer. <laughs> Oh yeah, or get a lawyer. Uh, so I, I think that um, it's certainly that that's the, the right idea. I, I agree with that concept, but there's only so much you can sort of tell a, a recruit or a player um, about that. And I think sometimes you need adults in that person's life to sort of say, "Hey, see this through." Like, there's no guarantee that the next school that you're going to um, is going to be a better opportunity for you. And I think something that we've seen in these first few years of the transfer portal is you might go into the transfer portal and not realize how low your or like how unpopular your stock is. Like you might not have as good of opportunities as you would have thought you would have. And then, so maybe then there's some regret even before you end up at the, the next school that you end up at. So there are, there will be some cautionary tales. And I think um, rec recruits and players will sort of learn the, the do's and don'ts of the transfer portal, if you will, and how to how to sort of navigate that. Notre Dame will has and will continue to have the advantage of like a lot of the kids that come to Notre Dame come here for the degree um, in addition to playing football. So a lot of guys don't necessarily want to leave until they do get that degree. Um, so even though that they they aren't punished for transferring earlier early and not waiting to graduate. Um, it's almost like a punishment for someone who wanted to graduate from Notre Dame. Like, well, I'm not going to be able to get that degree that I came here for. Um, and so uh, you, you'll see a lot of guys sticking it out. So if there were somehow to be limits, which again, like, I don't think that is, that is necessarily uh, a reality um, in the future that maybe it would be related to sort of how many guys leave in the transfer portal in terms of how many you could bring to you. But then you get into a where it's like, well, okay, are you, are you just, forcing guys out um, because you want to bring more in. And so I think there would be a, a tough gray area there. So I think, I think giving the power to the players is the right move. Um, even if there are negative aspects to that. Um, and it's just incumbent upon the people um, around those players to sort of give them the best information to make those choices um, as the, as the decisions come their way. I think the biggest concern with a portal universally, and this wasn't something Marcus brought up, is other schools trying to tempt them, tempt players into the portal with NIL money and NIL right. deals. And and that's happened. And there's also players like Zay Flowers from Boston College that turn those offers down. Yeah, the, the sort of the amount of change that happened all at once. Um, it's not just like, okay, here's the transfer portal. And now here's a, like, there wasn't a lot, there wasn't a huge adjustment period for each different change. It sort of all sort of came in one big wave. And so I think everyone's just trying to figure out the new reality and how to handle it. And um, I think things will sort of sort out, or I guess maybe, um, maybe I'm being naive. Maybe, maybe I should say, I hope they, they sort out and, and work in the best interest of, of everyone involved. All right, Derek, let's get to some questions. We naturally, we answered some of the questions already in our headlines. Um, so thanks to James Owens for asking about Tobias Merriweather and Michael McFadden for asking us about Steve Angeli. Um, let's go to Michael for another question that we've um, been asked previously, but we can we can address again. Um, and uh, his comment got broken into two. So do you think they'll get a quarterback in the transfer portal or roll with Drew Pine and Buckner to battle it out next season? Uh, I I will repeat this in every show if we need to. They need to get somebody uh, from the transfer portal to compete with those two. That doesn't mean that player is going to win out in that competition, but they need somebody that's the caliber of quarterback that could start. I mean, the one thing when you look at this Notre Dame-USC game, the biggest difference between these two teams or the biggest obvious difference is the quarterback play. and. You know, Caleb Williams came through the transfer portal um, and all the other USC quarterbacks left. Um, mm -hmm. And they're actually, none of them are really doing very well. Keaton Slovis uh, is struggling at Pitt. Uh, JT Daniels, who 
went to Georgia first and then to West Virginia. He just got replaced at West Virginia. And uh, Jackson Dart, I believe, is at Mississippi State. And he's doing okay out of the three, but not as well as Drew Pine. Uh, But I I think it's a necessity that Notre Dame has. And the reason I say it is experience. They need the experience. They have a pretty good roster coming back next year. uh, and, And the quarterback is the missing piece. Now, that may push... Tyler Buckner or Drew Pine to new heights. Uh, I think we've got a pretty good idea of what Drew Pine ceiling looks like. We don't have a good idea of what Tyler Buckner's. That's pretty speculative. Um, so I think that's the best and only way to go at this point. Yeah, I tend to agree as well. I I think I think it's not just like we believe that. I, I do believe that the, the appetite within the program this off season will be greater to bring in a transfer quarterback than it was this past off season. Um, I just think that there um, needs to be more genuine competition besides just Tyler Buckner, Andrew Pine. Um, I don't believe that Steve Angeli would be someone that it would be necessarily pushing those guys to be a starter next season. Um, and if that were the case, we probably would have seen more of Steve Angeli this season, but I think that's part of the reason we have as well. There is that gap there that they believe um, between Drew Pine and Steve Angeli. So um, I think that is what's best for Notre Dame. Um, who that person is remains to be seen. There there should be some intriguing options out there, and uh, we'll certainly be covering it throughout the offseason on the Insider Lounge. All right, next question is from Mike DeVoy, who I should give a shout-out to earlier for submitting his questions in advance. Can you tell us more about Kenny Minchie? Is he a three-star because he played against subpar competition? didn't camp a lot or something else. I'm a little bit confused why he's a three star just in a little bit of film. I've seen from people I've talked to about him, the fact that he competed at the elite 11, you usually don't have three star players or players that stay three stars after they've competed there. Um, I think some of it is because he's been injured most of the season. I think he played Tyler. Is that right? In a couple of games and was injured and is just kind of coming back from injury now. I think so, yes. Or and, no, he yeah, he, he came back and then played for a little bit and then I think they ended up losing that game and he didn't finish his last game of the season. So so not a whole lot of senior year to go on to lift him up. But um you know, we're not I guess supposed to talk about other recruiting services, but Rivals isn't the only one that rates players. He's a four-star on some of the other ones. Um, and Tom Lemming, who did not get to see him in person originally, but has reviewed his film. Tom has been a long time asset for us. He's been doing this recruiting thing since gosh, the 1980s. And he's really impressed with Kenny Minchie, his accuracy, his athleticism. He's from the same high school as Golden Tate in Hendersonville, Tennessee, which is what Tyler Pope. Pope John Stop. Paul II. Okay. okay. <laughs> I don't want to get my popes mixed up. <laughs> yeah, it's a Catholic Catholicism test. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I guess just to add to that, I think my understanding of the national analyst view of it was, one, I think I think our national analyst, Sean Williams, who is the most familiar with him, who's actually um, new in his role as a national analyst, is the highest on Sean Williams. He's the one who covers him in his area in Tennessee, has seen him the most um, and I think was pushing for him and will push for him to get a four-star rank rating. Um, and then there are the others, I think we're maybe in a bit of a wait and see. Let's see how he does as a senior. I think he probably has done enough. I, for my opinion, I don't really know. I haven't asked them like, Hey, what are you guys going to do that? I know that they will be getting into um, rating and ranking update discussions here shortly with senior seasons wrapping up for these guys. So um, there's nothing preventing uh, rivals from uh, increasing his star rating to four stars, um, even though he did get hurt. And I think there's some questions there about his shoulder. Um, there, what he he had a, 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 some impressive moments at the Elite Eleven camp this summer. Um, and I think there was just maybe let's 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 see a little bit more from his, his senior year. I think that's that's sort of the product of having rankings and ratings that. Uh, develop and evolve over time. When you start rating ranking kids when they're freshmen or sophomores in high school, there's going to be a lot more left um, in their development. And sometimes it's not good development. Maybe a kid starts high and then 
and then you you aren't as high as him as as, the, as his career goes on. So, I, but I think the opposite is probably the case with Kenny Minchie. Um, and uh, Notre Dame certainly liked him, um, has liked him a lot for a while since this summer, um, and made him one of the priorities. And it was just a matter of whether or not Kenny Minchie was sort of reciprocating that interest, and he did in terms of backing off his commitment from Pittsburgh and visiting Notre Dame this past weekend. And we'll see if he decides to jump in Notre Dame's class because it's certainly a need for Notre Dame, um, and he appears to be the guy that Notre Dame would like to fill that need. All right, next question is from Roger Lancey. Do you think ND can get a lot of pressure on the SC quarterback with just their linemen, or will they blitz? USC is kind of in the middle of the pack in terms of sacks given up, um, and that speaks – not so good to their offensive line, given how elusive Caleb has been um, in getting away from the rush. I would say no Notre Dame has gotten a lot better with their front four, and that's been since Notre Dame moved Justin Adam Alola to the other defensive end spot and then put Riley Mills inside in that inside rotation uh, with, with Howard Cross still at nose guard. That, there's some pretty good combinations, but I still think there's going to have to be some blitzing to get to Caleb Williams. So it's going to be a mixed bag. The thing about it is, and and this goes along with the evolution of the defense that we talked the first time, you know, early in the year, Notre Dame's blitzes, <laughs> especially in safety blitzes, were really bad. Um, and now you see the corner blitzes and the safety blitzes getting home. You see the linebackers getting penetration. If they don't get to the quarterback, they kind of force them back in a way where they run into a defensive lineman. So I've been much more impressed with their blitzing as of late. Yeah, I think they have done a good job with that. I think Xavier Watts is, is particularly pretty good as a safety doing that. Um, Ramon Henderson has shown some promise doing that at times during the season. Tariq um, even once. Tariq, yeah, Tariq Bracey, that was the next one I was going to get to. I think he's... It's it's sort of weird to say. I don't think anyone would have guessed that uh, last year that Tariq Bracy would be someone that you'd feel some level of confidence in in, in sort of rushing the the passer. And um, he had one of his pressures led to the first interception from ben, Benjamin Morrison. He didn't actually get to the quarterback, and the running back actually hit him pretty good. And because Tariq Bracy can only bring so much to the to the party with his speed and strength, but. Uh, he he, uh, the running back hit him pretty good and kept him away from the quarterback. But it, that presence alone sort of forced the quarterback one way and into some more pressure from Notre Dame's defensive line. So um, I think Notre Dame has sort of figured that out um, and done a better job with it. But I think you're going to have to do multiple things. I don't think you can just do one thing against Caleb Williams. You have to try to confuse him, have to be efficient in what you're doing, whether it's blitzing or, or rushing with four. Um, and mixing things up. No, uh, USC's offensive line has been particularly good as pass blockers. Now, I think Caleb Williams deserves an, a lot of credit for that and being very good at pocket awareness and getting rid of the football. Um, but USC, that's the strength of their line is their ability to pass block. They're better pass blockers than they are run blockers, I guess, at least in my opinion. But um, I think that's one of the reasons why USC was among the where are they semifinalists at this point in the Joe Moore Award process. Um, so I think that, uh, that has, has something to do with it. So the Notre Dame will be tested in terms of if it can get pressure on USC and quarterback Caleb Williams with just four guys. I was laughing when you were talking about Bracey. Cause I remember back to his freshman year, they put him in a game against Pitt and Pitt had a big back and Bracey got a hold of him. And it was like a little kid getting a piggyback ride. He, the <laughs> kid ended up going out of bounds because I think he lost his balance. But Bracey's come a long way since then. Yeah, if it's the same Pitt game I'm remembering, that was a pretty tough game for him. I don't think he had a very good game against Pittsburgh. I think that was in Notre Dame Stadium. And yeah, um, he uh, that was probably one of the uh, the low points in his in his career at Notre Dame. But he is he's played fantastic. I think. He wasn't necessarily following Zay Flowers constantly, but he was matched up with him a number of times and was um, certainly a contributor in, in Notre Dame, limiting uh, his productivity last weekend. And uh, the snow, I'm sure, and the wind gets an assist on, on that as well. All right, Eric, those are the questions we have for now. If folks want to keep 
uh, submitting questions. We can get to some uh, later on in the show, but we will get back to some of the other things that we wanted to discuss. Okay. Well, let's discuss the Boston College game a little bit since it was such a good game, really the most complete game Notre Dame has played this season. I, you know, Clemson would certainly go down as a much more quality opponent, but I mean, this game, other than not having a block punt in it, it was probably the perfect <laughs> game that Notre Dame has played. And you look at, you know, offensively, uh, just dominating with 44 points. You know, it's interesting. Notre Dame is 75th in the country in total offense, and yet they put together five games of where they've scored 35 points or more. <laughs> and that's only the second time in the history of the school they've been able to do that. It tells, you how, never... bad it, tells you how bad it was to start the season. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's and it's never, uh, yeah, that was bad. And it's never gotten a six. Now, they've also gotten some assists, you right. know, block punts for touchdowns, defensive pick sixes. Um, the defense forced five turnovers in this game. And, and they're going to have to win the turnover battle against USC, I will say. The five turnovers in this game, which set up Notre Dame with some short fields, the offense there. The defense allowed 173 yards, and I keep this database of performances, and that's the third best since Brian Kelly was hired in 2010. Uh, the best was 163 yards against Pitt in 2020, and uh, I think 164 by Texas in the 2015 opener. So they were right there, very close. If they if they had left their starters in maybe a few more plays, it would have been under 150 yards. Um, Boston College was the worst rushing team uh, in the country coming in. They lived up to that reputation. They actually <laughs> had five yards less than thanks their- Thanks to their uh, last run. Yeah, thanks to the last run going backwards. Tyler and I had these prop bets that we do if you ever see our place your bets thing on YouTube. And we were kind of rooting for them not to get to the 61 and a half yards, <laughs> which was a strange thing to be rooting for. You know, special teams was really good in terms of winning field position. Blake Groupie kind of broke out of his slump. He had three pretty good field goals, five extra points. Um, there was just, I mean, it was just really a really good game. And that's something Notre Dame hadn't done is, is beat an overmatched team and make them look even more overmatched than they were. Uh, you know, they had kind of played down to their competition in a lot of games. In this game, they didn't. They they really exceeded. And, you know, you can say all you want about Boston College, but they were coming off of a top 25 upset of NC State. Uh, so, you know, it wasn't like they've been slogging along the past few weeks. That quarterback, Emmett Moorhead, had really um, – played very well in the two previous games. He had 330 yards passing in each of those games. Against Notre Dame, he was 9 of 22 with three interceptions for 117 yards. And so, you know, I think the biggest compliment to how Notre Dame played was it really made Phil Jakovic's presence there irrelevant. I mean, nobody was talking about Phil Jakovic once the game started. Yeah, only pregame after his – uh very interesting Instagram post, to say the least. Uh, a couple of numbers that I wanted to highlight. I, I thought it was important that all three running backs, uh, or at least the the top three running backs for Notre Dame, averaged at least 6.5 yards per carry. So to get pr good production out of all of those was good. Chris Tyree being the one that hasn't necessarily been able to do that in recent weeks and to see him um, find some success in, in a number of ways, including running between the tackles um, against Boston College, was, was uh, promising. Um, and the other thing related to Notre Dame's offense was finishing eight of 13 on third downs. And that even includes two late third downs when I believe some of the backups were playing. I know Drew Pine was still in there, but um, Jabron Payne was in there. And uh, I don't think Notre Dame's entire offense, uh, offensive starters were still in there. So to be over 60 percent and they did it both on the ground and in the air, they were three of five on passing uh, third down conversions. Um, and five of eight on rushing third down conversion. So to be over 60% in either of those ways um, was, a, was a good sign. So um, that actually, I think, is important going to, into USC because USC is not very good. I mean, they're not very good defensively in a lot of ways, uh, but they're not very good defensively on third down either. I, I believe they were ranked 100th um, in the FBS in terms of third down um, 
conversion percentage percentage allowed. Um, so that is something that Notre Dame can try to exploit. Um, obviously, you prefer to not get to third down, but when you do get to third down, especially when you're trying to keep USC's offense on the field or off the field, uh, man, I can't can't get through this without messing up uh, off the field. Uh, you, you want, want me to just to, to talk? <laughs> you want to be just able move to... your lips, and I'll try to imitate <laughs> blah, 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 your voice. Watermelon, watermelon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I just think that Notre Dame needs to be able to keep its offense on the field by converting third downs against USC, and so to have some success against Boston College um, is promising. All right, let's do quickly our um, homage to the offensive line are in the trenches segment. And then we're going to talk just a little bit about bowl possibilities. Offensive line, Zeke Correll was credited with being the offensive player in the game. I think, you know, Marcus Freeman intimated that, you know, this was kind of representative of the offensive line play as a whole. But Zeke Correll in particular had a difficult assignment. Apparently Boston College's nose guard had a seven tackle, two tackle for loss game against NC State. He had one tackle against Notre Dame. And so th- that's a good sign if, you know, Zeke Correll stands out among that offensive line group because, you know, early in the year, that was kind of the concern of him being the fifth best lineman and in, in whether teams could take advantage of that. Yeah, I I thought Zeke Correll played well. I don't know that he was like necessarily the, the like standout offensive lineman. I thought the offensive lineman that impressed me the most was Blake Fisher. Um, I thought he played a really good game, was very physical and helped Notre Dame a lot in the run game um, and, and did a pretty good job pass blocking as well. So I thought he's had he's really played well in the second half of the season, I think. Um, and I think we just continue to see him sort of elevate his game, play with more confidence. Um, and he's, he's so athletically and physically gifted that, that when he's playing with that confidence, he's uh, someone that you do not want to see uh, trying to clear you out of the way if you're a defender because he has – um, a lot of gifts, and um, when he's playing with the right technique, can really, uh, can really knock you ba- knock you back pretty good. Before we started the show, I actually tweeted out a clip of one of the more impressive uh, <laughs> uh, blocks he had. Uh, he just really bullied a defensive end and, and made it look pretty bad for that for that poor guy. But uh, overall, the offensive line played really well. I thought in the run game you could just see sort of the line just collapsing Boston College and and creating all kinds of different running lanes for Notre Dame's running back. So a good bounce back effort from them. I don't know that all of the issues, or I, I know that all the issues weren't on them against Navy in the second half, but I think that Notre Dame's offensive line could have done a better job than it did. Um, and it sort of played with a bit of a chip on its shoulder, I think, and bounced back. And I, I talked to Josh Lug last week going into the game, and I thought Josh Lug probably played the best game of his career against Clemson and then wasn't so sharp against Navy. And I was like, is that just kind of a reminder of how humbling this game could be? He's like, oh yeah. He's like, he was like, yeah. I just, you have to be on on top of everything, no matter who the opponent is, um, because that that opponent can take advantage of you if you're not doing everything as you're trained to do and um, sort of executing at the highest level. So um, Notre Dame will need to do that against USC, even though that defense hasn't had a lot of great games. They they do create turnovers, so Notre Dame sort of controlling the ball. And, and not giving USC the football will be a big key on Saturday, I believe. Okay. And I think, you know, we talked about this not on YouTube. Let's talk about it on YouTube. Notre Dame did not make the semifinal list for the Joe Moore Award. I guess I was a little bit surprised, but you brought up the Navy thing probably – didn't help their cause and they weren't good at the beginning of the year, but a lot of teams, I think there's a grace period going into the year for the first couple of weeks. Uh, So what's your assessment? Do you think this is one of the best nine or 10 offensive lines in the country? You probably haven't seen more than nine or 10, but right. Yeah. I haven't studied enough to, to know as much as the, the Joe war, Joe Moore award committee. Who's they, those that's for anything you want to say about like the different award uh, awards, um, and the committees that vote for them, they're relying on more than just sports writers who don't necessarily get a chance to to write on the game. They have guys that sit there and they 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 watch film of everyone. I mean, that's that's certainly not what we we do in our jobs. Even when we're asked to vote on different awards, I'm not I'm not sitting down and crunching uh, USC versus Oregon State film or whatever like that. We we have uh, there's just not enough time in the day with the responsibilities that we have in terms of trying to know everything that we possibly can about Notre Dame. Uh, so 
I I think the the offensive line can when it's playing its best, like against Clemson, it's one of the top two or three lines in the country probably. Um, but it hasn't always played to that standard. Um, now I'm sure some of those other offensive lines haven't as well. I'm not. I mean, that's pretty typical that an offensive line is going to have a bad game here or there. It's it's very hard to be good all the time because you need everyone every one of your five guys on the same page and doing uh, executing at a high level because just one guy can sort of mess things up for the rest of them. So I, I think that um, I understood them not being included. I think coming off of the, that Navy performance. Um, in combination with sort of having those holes in the resume early in the season, sort of if Notre Dame was sort of on that line of should we put them in or should we not, I think that was a good good and easy reason to sort of say, ah, they they should be able to do better against Navy running the football than they were, even if you're even if Navy's loading the box the way it did. Okay, let's uh, talk about the bowl picture a little bit. We'll go through it kind of quickly. Um, you know, and some people, well, you know, why bother with a with a bowl game? I'll tell you though, if nothing else, the practices you get in December are really valuable. Ask a coach who doesn't get to go to a bowl game about how much they miss those December practices. They really help your team get ready for next year in addition to the bowl game. But really, there are five bowls that are in play now that Notre Dame's up to eight wins. And this is how I kind of have slotted them from most probable the least probable. The most probable to me would be the Holiday Bowl, December 28th versus the Pac-12 in San Diego. That would be followed by the Gator Bowl, December 30th versus the SEC in Jacksonville, Florida. The Cheez-It Bowl, December 29th versus the Big 12 in Orlando. A New Year's Six Cotton Bowl date with a group of five champ January 2nd in Arlington. And the least likely would be the ReliaQuest Bowl, January 2nd versus the SEC in Tampa, Florida. If you're hoping for a Notre Dame-LSU matchup, the ReliaQuest Bowl would be the possibility there. But Notre Dame, first of all, LSU would have to lose to Texas A&M and Georgia to, I think, end up that far down in the bowl tier. I think they're a New Year's Six if all they do is lose to Georgia. Um, and then the ReliaQuest Bowl is is convoluted because the ACC Notre Dame slot's not guaranteed. There's things that have to happen in terms of a Big Ten team taking an Orange Bowl slot over an SEC team. So to me, there's too many things that Notre Dame can't control there. The Cotton Bowl date in the um, in the New Year Six, you know, we're going to find out Tuesday night where Notre Dame is in the college football playoff rankings. They were 15th in the coaches poll, 13th in the um, AP poll, I think they need to get to number 10 to be included in the AP poll. If they beat a number five USC team on the road, they probably get to 10, maybe not this after this week, but when you add in the um, winners and losers of some of the conference championship games, I think Notre Dame would, would be in the top 10 or they would be number 10. Uh, but I don't know that that's the best scenario for the Irish, they would play the group of five champion, the highest ranked of those group of five teams, which right now would be uh, one of those teams in the American Athletic Conference, which would be Cincinnati or UCF or uh, Tulane, Tul one of those. Tulane is teams. the highest right now, I think, right? Right. They they are, although uh, I think Tulane and Cincinnati have to play each other, and then there's going to be a championship game. But UCF got beat by Navy. They were in the driver's seat. Right. Uh, to win that conference. And now they are needing some help to get into the championship game. They have uh, some tiebreakers. So really, Holiday Bowl to me is the most likely. And you'd be facing somebody like Utah or UCLA in that particular bowl game. Yeah, and I would be <laughs> proponent of that. I you You're a bowl guy, so I don't know that I have much to add. I, I think it would be... It would be, I think, a little bit of a bummer for Notre Dame to sort of like crawl into this possibility of getting into New Year's Six Bowl and then play against a, a group of five team. Or uh, if if the, the Orange Bowl thing is just not attractive at all to, to yeah. potentially do, have a rematch with Clemson or North Carolina. Right. So um, and and I, I don't Notre Dame would have to get higher than tenth to get into that game. They would be they would have to be let, let's say ranked higher than Alabama, and I don't right, think yeah. that that's happening. 
yeah, I think that would be that would be tough. I even 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 with USC playing well um, and coming into this game ranked high highly, um, and then who knows what USC does after this game and um, playing for the Pac-12 championship as well. So um, we have one other question here from Michael McFadden. I wanted to maybe squeeze in before we talked a little bit more about USC, if you don't mind. Okay, sure. All right. Question from Michael McFadden is if ND is not going to move Chris Tyree to flanker with his speed, why not have him run sweeps and off tackle rather than off center and off guard? Um, and I can jump in here with some stats if you'd like, Eric. I have some. Please do, because we're talking about getting this question in the press box. We anticipated <laughs> yes. this. Yeah. I, first, I think you, you need to keep the defense honest. Like you can't be predictable in ways that whenever he gets the ball, he's going to go on the edge. But he does run to the edge. I think people sort of see the runs to the middle and say, well, why do they always do that? Well, it's not, they're not always doing that. According to um, the rushing direction that pro football focus has charted um, 20 times is the most carries he's had to any direction that's off the left edge uh, or out. And so out, outside the left tight end, even if there's a tight end um, there's the middle of the left, uh, which is between the center and the guard on the left-hand side. Um, and then third most is right off the right tackle. Um, fourth most is to the middle, right. Fifth most is left tackle and sixth most is right edge. So, so four of the six highest running locations that he's had is either to the, to the tackle or outside of the tackle. So I, or I guess actually even, even when it's listed as tackle, that means it's going outside the tackle. So either outside of the tackle or outside of the tight end. So the majority of his runs are going in those directions. It's not like it may seem like that. Like anytime you see it, it's like, Oh, why are they doing that? And I understand that feeling because certainly Logan Diggs and, um, Audrey Estime are better players at doing that, but you have to keep the defense honest. I think there's also a chance if he can find a crease that he can really get through there and, and be gone and not get caught like maybe Audrey Estime or Logan Diggs does in some of those situations. So I think Notre Dame is certainly willing to run him to the outside. I think it's a um, a bit of a fable that they they aren't willing to do that. Um, they, they will they will do that and uh, um, find different ways to use him. I, and we've we've talked about previously that. It, they could move him to potentially slot next season if that's if that's what the way they want to go because they do have such a a talented running back room with some some talented freshmen coming in next season and then Jerry and Price getting back from his torn Achilles. Amen. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say you seem like you don't have anything else to add on that. No, I, I was gonna. I, what I would have added had you not is next year and and we'll get a chance to talk to Chris actually tomorrow night at the interviews and if um. If I am not preoccupied talking to Al Golden at that moment, I plan to ask Chris in a kind of backdoor way if he would welcome more reps at the slot maybe next year, if he's given that any thought. Right. And he may say, I'm only focusing on one game at a time. <laughs> right, right, right. It's hard to get them to be honest on those things sometimes, but you never know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Then I'll ask him about his NIL deal and soften them up a little bit. <laughs> All right. Uh, is there anything else about USC that we want to hit on before we get out of here? Sure. Um, as far as USC, I think I closed that one. Here we go. We mentioned second in the country in total offense, third in scoring offense, sixth in passing efficiency. Individually, Caleb Williams is ninth, but as a team, they're sixth. I mean, offensively, turnover margin. They have committed the fewest turnovers of any team in the country. They've gained, they've turned people over the third most amount, and then they're first in turnover margin. And that's shown up in their close games. And that's why Notre Dame needs to win the turnover battle. Uh, it's it's saved USC. One of the big reasons they're not eight and three or seven and four is because of that turnover margin. When you look at defensively, 68th and run defense, 68th and pass, efficiency defense, 96th and total defense, 68th and scoring defense. So a big part of the reason there's a big gap between total and scoring defense is because of those turnovers. Um, they're good in the red zone. You, you mentioned earlier bad on third down, 17th and sacks. So they're pretty comparable. Notre Dame is 13th. Um, Always a special team's disaster in terms of their <laughs> coverage and their return game. They just don't seem to pay any attention to it. They're usually one of the most penalized teams in the country. That's the case again this year. But uh, 
boy, offensively, they do an awful lot of good things. And again, watch that turnover margin. That's going to be huge in Saturday night's game. Yeah, there are so many good receivers on that offense. So you can't really focus on one person, but Jordan Addison is the is the star there. He, like we mentioned earlier, won the Blitnikoff Award uh, last season. He's one of the 10 semifinalists. And um, I think I alluded and to Michael this. Michael Mayer wasn't a semifinalist. He was not, although Brock Bauer is a tight end um, from Georgia, was. Um, and for those that aren't aware, um, it's not just the best wide receivers. It's the best pass catcher is the voting criteria for – um, the bullet and cough award. So tight ends are eligible. Um, I'm not sure the last time a tight end won. Um, I know Kyle Pitts they, was in the mix. They've never won. Um, it, they haven't had tight ends a part of it that long, but I don't know that they ever will just because the numbers are never, you know, the top tight end in the country with receiving is Michael Mayer, and he's not among the top 10 or 15 overall receivers. The numbers just and receiving yards aren't going to be there. Yeah, I tend not to enter. Usually, like if there's, like there's a Mackey Award, so I'm gonna like uh, Michael right. Mayer and Brock Bowers can fight it out for that. Like I don't need to like give them the ninth or tenth spot on the Bolitnikov Award ballot. So I, I just think that, um, that because there are there is a tight end award that I, I'm not too concerned about whether Michael Mayer makes that or not. I to be transparent, I didn't include him on my ten. Bolitnikoff Award semifinals, but I didn't include Brock Bowers either before anyone anyone jumps down my throat. Uh, and to, to I mentioned earlier, I, I sort of summed up the the uh, Bolitnikoff Award stats that for, of the guys Notre Dame has gone against. Uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. is one of the semifinalists. Notre Dame uh, limited him to five catches for 56 yards. Uh, Josh Downs had the most success against Notre Dame. He had five catches for only 32 yards, but he did have two touchdowns of in those five catches. And then Zay Flowers last week against Boston College, he had three catches for 46 yards. So Jordan Addison will be the fourth of the 10 Billitnikoff Award semifinalists that Notre Dame has faced, and we'll see what kind of job Notre Dame secondary can do in terms of in terms of limiting his production because that is a, certainly a tall task. Well, especially if Jaden Mickey's going to play 30 or more snaps. And Jaden is a really good player, but he has not – uh, past the freshman growth curve the way that Ben Morrison has. Yeah, he's been in some unfortunate positions, and it would be a bit of a neat redemption story for him if he was able to play against USC um, near his hometown um, and have a good performance, and um, that would be kind of neat to see from him as a guy who – he doesn't lack the confidence, so he's going to go out there believing that he can shut down whoever he's lining up against. So we'll see how much he's asked to do that and how he does when he does. Well, the one thing is, you mentioned he's not afraid. He played against a lot of great high school quarterbacks. I think his first career interception in high school was against Bryce Young yep. so of Alabama. So um, he's he is – eventually we're going to be talking about him in glowing terms as we do with Ben Mo. All right. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in live or watching this on replay. Please subscribe to receive reminders for future live shows. Uh, throw us a like, and in the comments, tell us your favorite Notre Dame-USC memory. Eric, do you have a favorite Notre Dame-USC memory? I would say um, the 2012 game, it wasn't a great game, but there was so much on the line because it meant Notre Dame as the number one team in the country, which they hadn't been in two decades, mm -hmm. was going to the national championship. That would be my favorite Notre Dame-USC memory. All right, and now Notre Dame has has the op er, opportunity to be the spoiler for USC's national championship uh, chances this weekend. So next on our agenda uh, is the Inside ND Sports podcast on Tuesday, and we'll be back here on YouTube on Friday um, with our Place Your, Des Place Your Bets predictions for the USC game. Um, there's always written content for you on InsideNDSports.com and plenty of discussion happening on the Insider Lounge. We know it is Thanksgiving week, so – you may be traveling, uh, so maybe you can listen to our podcast and have some opportunities to do that or turn on the YouTube video. Just don't do that while you're driving um, or just listen to the sound if that's the case. Uh, but we'll have plenty for you to read as well, and we'll be hard at work and uh, get to enjoy some time with family as well. So thank you for tuning in, and have a happy Thanksgiving.